Hey everybody, it's me, Paul, with Reporting Live from my sofa. How's everybody doing out there? I hope you all been well. As you can see, we're all ready for the holiday season here at the Camper Squad. Now listen, y'all, this morning, this weekend, all the above, I went on a huge binge. This was on Netflix, on a new like mini series they put out, and this is about the serial killer, <laughs> allegedly, Henry Lee Lucas. Now, the name of this is The Confessions Killer. Now, before we go any further in this, if you do not want spoiler alerts, if you want this whole thing to be like a surprise and da-da-da-da-da, then do not watch this any further. However, if you want to hear my commentary along with kind of a summation of his case, as well as some other facts about it, then continue to watch. Now, also, just know, we are going to be talking about Otis Tool because the two go hand in hand, but just like the series, we're going to mostly focus on Henry. I'll be doing another video specifically on Otis because he literally deserves an entire channel devoted to him. So that is that. I hope you join me for the ride. And without further ado, let's review. Okay, now again, remember, the whole basis of the reason they even made this because Henry Lee Lucas is a pathological liar. So keep that in mind as you go through with this. That's what's very frustrating about this case. And as I research more into it, you know, it, on the surface level, it's like, oh my gosh. But as you scratch beneath it, you just always have to keep in mind, this guy lied about every single thing. So we're going to go over some stuff that we, we basically do know. He was born August 23rd, 1936, Blacksburg, Virginia. Now, according to Henry, his father was a double amputee. His mother was a prostitute who was very violent. She allegedly has sent him to the emergency room numerous times. Now, one of the murders that we do know for a fact that he did was killing his mother. In March 1960, he killed her when they got into an altercation. Now, he was sentenced to 20 to 40 years for this, and he was paroled in 1970. So that right there is like, whoa, different times. You killed your own mother and you got out after 10 years, but he didn't learn his lesson there. He went on a year later and tried to kidnap a 15-year-old at gunpoint. He got caught for that, and he served another five years. But again, look at these lenient sentences for these really horrible crimes. Between the years of 1975 and 1983 is when Henry Lucas alleges that he committed up to 600 murders. Now, Henry Lee Lucas would meet Otis Tool at a soup kitchen in Florida. And literally the first day they met, Henry goes back to his house and moves in with him and they are a thing and they stay that way. They both have extremely dark interests and will go on to pursue these dark interests together. Now, again, like I said, I'm gonna do a different video on Aldous, but there's a few things that I feel like we just need to put out there so that we can get how these two were a tender match made in hell. So Tool had just as much of a troubled childhood as Henry did. Some of the things that happened to him, and these are just literally some of them, his mother dressed him up as a girl throughout his childhood, his older sister raped him, and his father prostituted him out to neighbors. Now, Tool had a 15-year-old intellectually disabled niece named Becky Powell. Now, Henry would eventually become romantically involved with Becky Powell and kind of put Tool to the side. Now, Becky would be killed herself, and that would happen August 23rd of 1982. Becky and Henry had been, like, traveling and going around together and doing all this stuff, and they had made their way to somewhere in Texas. They got into an argument with where they were staying, and Lucas lured Powell out into a field. He kills her, he dismembers her, he's scatters her remains all over the field, and this should cause really no other reason. He goes and he lures the owner of the ranch out there, and he kills her too. And then he stuffs her body in a drainage ditch. So now, for the remainder of the story, just keep in mind the names Becky Powell and Otis Tool. So now, while this whole little group here had been on these little murderous rampages together and crime sprees and this and that and cheating and da-da-da-da-da, Tool was going to be the first one to get arrested out of them. And he was arrested in 1983. And he was on an arson charge, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Now, he was also involved in other murders. I mean, he burnt the guy alive in his house. Horrible, horrible, horrible things. Now, Lucas would also be arrested shortly thereafter in 1983, and that would be for a possession of a deadly weapon. Now, this is where the tables kind of turn, and we start to see 
the Confessions Killer with what we watched on Netflix, if you've watched it. So Tool goes on to admit to killing Becky, as well as his landlord, Kate Rich was her name. She was 82 years old. And Tool wasn't so quick to be admitting to all the stuff that he did, but once he saw that Henry was doing it and kind of the attention that he got and all the good stuff he was getting, Tool started going along and backing his stories up and admitting to other things as well. Okay, so now that we have like a little bit of a backstory on these two, let's start talking about the confessions, stuff that we saw in the video and how they portrayed it. So one of the officers that was there when Lucas was arrested, he was like, look, he would not stop talking, you know, but they could not get a confession out of him. So they essentially kind of like did some reverse psychology and they quit talking to him. And this was the point where he started admitting to like Becky and Kate and those type murders that he did. Now he even goes to show where these remains are and takes them and says, I cooked one in the pot. I did this crazy stuff. Now, even crazier, though, is at the arraignment for these charges, as he's kind of like wrapping things up, he says to the judge, well, what are we going to do about these other hundred women that I murdered? And as you can imagine, remember, this is like before we have the technology that we do today. They don't really have DNA back then. You know, any of this stuff, you know, false confessions are kind of like not out there like they are today. So as you can imagine, this caused a huge uproar amongst law enforcement, the courtroom, you name it. Now, again, remember, he will go on to confess to like over 600 murders. He was interrogated for over 3,000 homicides that took place across 40 states. If you joined us for our book club here at the Sofa Squad when we read the case about Israel Keys, to me, honestly, he sounds like a pre-version of Israel Keys, but there was no way that Henry was going to pull off what Israel Keys did. If Israel Keys said he killed 600 people, you would probably believe him because he killed so many people and he was such a mastermind at it. And really, just watching this video, you're kind of like, eh, I don't know if he's that swift. So let's fast forward to some of the stuff that we're seeing with the task force that was set up to investigate these crimes. Now, somebody sits here and says they've killed 100 women like that. Oh, it's going to get some attention, and it did get attention. Now, Jim Bootwell, he was a former Texas, Texas Ranger and the Williamson County Sheriff at the time. Now, he is able to form a task force specifically formed to investigate all of the claims that Henry Lee Lucas is making. This essentially pivots Jim to act as like the gatekeeper to Henry. Now, during this time that they were doing this task force, Henry is kept at the local county jail, and we see this in the video and then literally doing some research and hearing people talk. I mean, he doesn't wear handcuffs around there. He's treated like a peer. I mean, they're bringing him lunch. They're giving him a car of cigarettes. He's on the phone helping them make phone calls. It's almost laughable to look at now with hindsight because it's just so absurd what he is getting away with. And it also is kind of like the central argument of this film, which is, did Henry lie? But more than that, this film was asking us to say, do we believe that the cops fed him the information or not? You know, basically corruption and things of that nature. So now it's obvious, you know, Henry Lee feels like one of the boys. One thing that becomes apparent to me is that because Henry Lee Lucas doesn't seem like he's kind of all there, he was very much enjoying this attention, but also the camaraderie and the friendship. I do think that he somewhat looked up to, especially like Jim Bootwell, he was a people pleaser. And they say this in the, in the film, in the documentary, you know, he wanted to please whoever he was around. And I did definitely got that vibe and I definitely feel like that was exploited of him to get what the Rangers wanted which was to clear up cases but as you can imagine things start to not add up now let's go talk about some of the cases so that we can see number one the damage that these false confessions caused but also so we can start looking at where it's like wait a minute uh what huh what what why did you say that now remember Henry was essentially like a movie star at this time for people in law enforcement and stuff like that, this was literally like a diamond in the rough, a needle in the haystack. People wanted their picture taken with him. They wanted to come interview him. This was like having access to something that people just normally don't have access to. And it was almost too good to be true. And that becomes very apparent in this documentary. Now, like I said, the documentary goes into several in-depth stories of this. I want to briefly talk about them here and their impact. 
Now, one such case was Deborah Sue Williamson. Her parents, the Lemons, were on there, and as well as her sister, I believe, was on there talking about the case. And it, it's a brutal murder. I mean, she had just been married. She stabbed to death at her house. It was horrible and sad. I mean, it was like three months after she was married. Now, Lucas claims that he killed her, and they take him to the crime scene. And he's like, yep, I did this. I went in the sliding glass door. I chased her out this, and da 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 So he signs his confession, and it's brought to the family. And the family reads it, and they're very quickly like, what? They're like, well, first of all, the door that he said he snuck in through, there was like a cabinet in front of there. Nobody could get in that door at that time. That's impossible. And they started seeing all these little discrepancies, and they basically were just like, this, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And they go to the cops with this, but basically the cops are just like, no, sorry, he signed it. We're kind of done. So they are unhappy with this, as anybody would be. So they go to the media, and the family starts doing their own investigating. And this is where I feel like the documentary brings to light this aspect. So with just very little investigating, a family has never done stuff like this, they start finding out that Henry wasn't in places that he said he was. They can get receipts on this. And the family's kind of just sitting here in shock over this. Even the murder of their own child, they find out that Henry, with receipts, was somewhere else, nowhere near that. And so they're, as I said, they're shocked over this because it didn't take much to find this out. And they go to the authorities, and the authorities really don't want to hear about this. One thing this film does is it starts to expose how Henry became a dumping ground for cold cases. I mean, literally, people from all over the country were calling and saying, you know, like, hey, what was Henry doing on this day? Nothing. Okay, I think he did this one. And pretty much, if you went and talked to Henry and gave him some cigarettes and told him his hair looked pretty that day, he was going to confess to your crimes. Now, remember, some of these things, Henry seemed to know little details that were just shocking to people. How else would he not know it if he didn't do it? And at the center of this, again, is the cons not the conspiracy, but you know, the idea that the sheriff and the, the rangers were feeding him information. Now, some of it might not have been intentional. I personally think that they accidentally fed him some of it. I think that they were giving him this information by saying, well, look at these pictures, and they didn't have enough intel and knowledge at that time to understand how damaging it was to be like, well, we're going to show him pictures of the crime scene and then take him to the crime scene and ask him what happened. Well, of course, he can sit there and just recount what he saw in the pictures, and it sounds good enough to be believable. And honestly, you know, like people were saying the thing, we want to declare our cases. Now, another such case like this was Carolyn Carvenka. Henry gave specific details about how he killed her, what he did with her. You know, it was him. He did it. It turns out that she had a seizure while driving and ended up going off the road and drowned. So Henry had nothing to do with this at all. One of the huge cases that would be a pivotal point for Henry that would change everything, because up until this point, I mean, yeah, he knew he wasn't leaving jail, probably. I mean, he might have thought he was, but the general public knew he wasn't leaving jail. But he wasn't on the death penalty yet. So there was a case that, sadly, the woman, the victim, was only known by the name of Orange Socks. And actually, she has been since identified. Her name is Deborah Jackson. She was 23 years old. But at that time, that's all they, they had to go on with her. And that's because she the only thing she had on when her body was found was orange socks. Now, this is another case that Henry claims that he's given out details that seemingly only he would know. He gets tried for this case. And so this is going to be a death penalty case. Well, a reporter starts looking into this, and he learns that Henry was working like a thousand miles away when this murder took place. And so the reporter goes to the cops, and he's like, look, here's this evidence. And they don't believe that. They're like, oh, well, you know, maybe he got the dates wrong, but, you know, he did it, da 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 Then the reporter takes this information to Henry's lawyers and they're like, oh my God, I mean, obviously if you're a defense lawyer trying to save your client's life, this is, you know, pure gold. Now the lawyers confront Henry and he says, you know what? I'm trying to commit legal suicide. I don't believe in killing myself, but I do believe in the state killing me. So I'm going to claim this. So you can only imagine as a defense attorney, you would be like, oh my God, are you serious? <laughs> you know, now me watching it uh, personally, I'm like this. I'm like, I don't blame him. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't want to sit in prison for the rest of my life. I'd be like, yeah, hello. Death penalty over here, please. He's going along with that. Now at some point, Henry starts to get wishy 
wishy-washy, like, maybe I want to live, you know, da 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 And so he's kind of willing to work with his defense attorneys, and they coach him, and they say, basically, you know what, we leave him, we're going to come back the next day, he's going to testify, they get in there this morning, and he's like, I changed my mind, I don't want to do it. And so the defense is like, we had nothing else, we had to rest. And he is found guilty and sentenced to death. For this time, it was very interesting to me to see this, because we see this take place a lot of times now where people claim innocence and it turns out they were innocent so it's interesting to see somebody literally with pure evidence and the person telling one person yeah you know what i just kind of want to be put to death so i'm going to take the claim for this murder and that seemingly be okay with everybody that part is shocking to me but even more twists and turns come from that case later, which we'll get to in a second. Now, right after this verdict and everything, when he's leaving the courtroom and doing all that, he's smiling and the reporter's like, why are you smiling? And he's all like, because I got what I want. Now, after this conviction, instead of sending him to prison, he stays in the county jail to continue helping with the task force. And they're flying him here, flying him there. He's getting royal treatment. Trust me, this is one thing that I think that is not humorous to me because it's, you know... It's not good for the victim's families. There are people who are victimized by him lying like this, but by the cops sitting here and doing whatever they wanted to, for me, I'm like this. I'm like, number one, did anybody ever think to check basic stuff where he was working? Things that the general public started doing for the officers and the rangers. Number two, I'm like, did anybody for one minute think, if this was an honest mistake, that he would confess to things just to get out of his cell and travel around and get hamburgers and sodas and fun stuff and cigarettes and all this stuff? Like, of who went it? Like, he's going to be in jail for the rest of his life. If he sits here and tells you that he did another crime and he gets to take a trip and get spoiled along the way, I mean, hello, like, do the math on that one. So that's the part that makes me think that they definitely were feeding him information on purpose a lot of the times because they just wanted to clear their docket because there's just too much common sense there to be like well of course he would lie about this why wouldn't he now the lies start to unravel this case it becomes way too much for people to ignore you know and one of the reporters who had been working on it who they had allowed to get in there he basically comes out with a story in the Dallas Tribune that is the first thing to kind of be like this could be a potential hoax like this guy is probably lying about being this you know the US history's most mass murderer psychopath in this article they're presenting you know marriage licenses work receipts gas receipts stuff like this and they're piecing together and they're like just in one month he would have had to have traveled 11,000 miles if you do basic you know arithmetic and drawing a line from point a to b on a map you will see it is next to impossible for him to have committed these crimes again i'm not trying to say it can't be done because look at israel keys but there's a vast difference with the technology that we have today and just things being different as to how he was able to do the crimes that he did versus someone like henry israel keys also had means like money to travel things of this nature henry lee couldn't hop on an airplane and go do this and that and da, 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 da. it just wasn't happening now another interesting twist of this case that comes up is the da vic fiesel i might be pronouncing his name wrong i'm sorry if i am now at one point a lot of these cases are brought to vic and vic's in this documentary and he's very honest and he's just like you know what yeah i wanted my five minute publicity photo with this dude yeah i was going to be running again and campaigning and this looks good to clear up cold cases yeah i'm not gonna lie you know i was very eager to get in line with everybody else but a lot of these cases are brought to him and he starts looking at it and he's like you know what i've done this a long time and something is fishy about this something doesn't seem right so they have a database that they can go get into to find out some of Henry's whereabouts and they go check some things and it doesn't match up so later on he goes back to look and it's been blocked like no one can access Henry's records and so he's like okay somebody clearly doesn't want someone finding out Henry's information in this which is another sign obviously of a cover-up now what eventually happens is the DA Vic he, he gets a warrant to have Henry transferred over to Waco away from Jim and the task force to do some questioning and this totally totally pisses the Texas Rangers off in a major way. So all of a sudden, there is like this investigative documentary that comes out on Vic that this news station does. And I mean, it's like a, I think 11 series thing. And they're like, you know, going into all these allegations that he's, you know, corrupt and 
you know, taking bribes to not prosecute cases and do all this crazy stuff. So a grand jury ends up gathering and they come back with a 12 count indictment against Vic. And of course he's like, this is in retaliation for me trying to expose what they're doing with Henry Lee Lucas. Like a year later or so, he is acquitted on all 12 charges. Because when this first, when they first started talking about it, I was like, well, you know, I don't really trust all DAs either. So what do y'all have to say about these 12 counts? It is very suspect that it came out at the same time that, you know, he's exposing them or whatever. But when they came back and were like, nope, he's acquitted on all these charges, I was like, oh, this makes y'all look even worse. But for him, he ends up winning a 58 million dollar libel suit against the TV station. When they showed Vic's house in this documentary, it was libel suit money type house. I was, I was like, mm -mm, I don't have to work no more. You know, but I'm like, you know, are you serious? Like, I mean, that is so much money. But, I mean, they completely trashed his name. I mean, his career was over with. But he was also like, you know what? I'm done. Politics is bleh. Another hero in the story is Linda Irwin. Now, she was an investigator in the homicide department in the Dallas Police Department. And Linda was called in to go talk to Henry because basically to see, like, look, he might have some information on cases that we have. So she goes in there and she's like, he gave me information for, like, maybe 10 cases, but none of it matched any of our stuff in Dallas. And she's like, I went back to my supervisor and I was like, I don't think this dude has killed anybody in Dallas. You know, and she had been told when she got there, look, give him a, a carton of cigarettes and, you know, he's going to tell you what you want to hear. And she just got a real slimy vibe off the whole thing. So she goes back to her supervisor, like I said, and the supervisor was like, you know what, girl, make up a totally fake case, like everything, crime scene, all the stuff. Take it back to Henry and see what he does. And now here's the thing. This is why I say like these unsung heroes in this, because you're going up against your coworkers. You're going up against the Texas Rangers. That is like major. That is like trying to say, I've got some evidence on, you know, the president that I'm going to come out with and I'm just little old me. You know what I'm saying? Like you're going up against a big thing, but also you're going up against the brotherhood. And so it takes a lot of bravery to go do something like that. But luckily for people like Linda and Vic and these people who caught in the reporters that call a spade a spade, you know, justice and the truth can come to the surface. Now, when Linda goes back there, Henry describes in detail how he killed this fake victim and describes all this stuff about it. And she knew. She was like, oh, my God. Yeah, she was like, this is bad. So all of this press, all of these lies are coming to the surface, and it becomes very apparent that there is some inconsistencies going on. So... After he is transported back to the jail from Waco, you know, all of this has gone down. And essentially, the cops are just like, well, look, we can keep working on this. And Henry's like, well, we can, but I didn't kill these people. And so they kind of come to this whole realization that he's not going to keep saying the things that he did. And so there's really no reason for you to still be here. So the cops are like, okay, we'll see you when we see ya. And he is shipped off to prison to then start his sentence away from all his special treatments, so on and so forth. Now, my opinion is that probably during this time, that's when this becomes real. And it's like, oh my God, now I'm here for the rest my life you know i don't have my boyfriend otis maybe he found another one i don't know now remember he was sentenced to death so he's on death row with numerous life sentences so as this is coming up and getting closer to his you know execution date at the time george w bush was the governor over there in texas stuff is presented to him evidence is just like you know, i mean it's obvious he did not kill this person i mean it's plainly obvious so george w bush actually gives him a stay he commutes his sentence and it was something unheard of that he did now this took place in 1998 now his journey even in death row life in prison all this stuff it, the inconsistencies do not stop at one point all of a sudden, out of the blue, he starts getting mail from guess who? Becky Powell, the person that he murdered. So he's receiving all these letters from Becky Powell. She goes public. Now at the time, he is working with Vic as his defense attorney. Vic was the DA who went through all that drama. He's representing him. And Vic's like, you know what? I'm going to get him off to the road. Da, 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 da. And this is going to help my career. And here is a smoking gun. This is going to prove everything. Here comes Becky Powell. And so she goes, she does interviews. And she's like, well, I was surprised that I was murdered and all this stuff. 
So he's like, you know what? I never killed her. Actually, the last time I saw her was at a truck stop, and she was getting into my truck, and they were going away, and I never saw her again. And, you know, now here she is. She even had a guy come on TV that was like, I'm her husband, and I met her. I picked her up at a truck stop. I mean, you know, I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You cannot make this up. So does it turn out that it's true? Absolutely not. It is a total lie. She is somebody who just fell in love with Henry and wanted to help him get out of jail. So he was essentially... And he says that he wasn't, but he was telling her little bits of information about the case in different letters that they corresponded with. So it wasn't ever uh, really obvious how she got all this information, but it was a total lie. She came clean. It was a total lie. She's like, I just wanted to marry him. I was in love with him. I wanted to do anything I could to get him out of there. And I'm like, honey, you know, first of all, that's a whole other set of issues we're going to get to. But first of all, you really think after all this, just because you claim, oh, he didn't kill me, he was just going to get out? I mean, are you crazy? That's a special kind of crazy. I mean, I'm just, I can't even wrap my mind around it. So that being said, Henry lives out through his remaining days of life in prison. Now, he died March 12th, 2001 of natural causes. Whatever lies, whatever truths that he had within him have gone to the grave with him. Now, Tool, as we talked about before, and I'm going to do a separate video on, he led investigators down the same path. He lied about, you know, tons of crimes and so on and so forth. And like I said, I'm going to do a different video on him. So my opinion overall is this. It was a great documentary. Definitely watch it. It is very slanted at the aspect of, number one, Henry's involvement as well as essentially showcasing how the corruption of the police and the rangers and whatnot uh, created the situation. So it's almost like a, a dual aspect of that. It's not getting super deep into the crimes because literally there are crimes that him and Otis like are convicted for and whatnot that are so heinous and out there. It wasn't a far stretch to believe that he killed all these people. I mean, because this was some Texas Chainsaw Massacre stuff that people were just like, what? I mean, people hadn't heard of something like this at this point. So, you know, my opinion is I do not think he killed all these people. I definitely think he's a serial killer. I definitely think Otis is a serial killer. I definitely think they were gay lovers that did some really messed up stuff and had some severe issues obviously. I think that the Rangers saw an opportunity. I think that, yes, some of the stuff, Henry was able to guess at it, and it seemed like he knew it, because maybe he, he did seem to have a pretty decent memory on stuff, so it was almost like, okay, some of the stuff he can kind of guess at. I think other things, they just started feeding him information, and he became a place for people to dump their cold cases on and clear their books, and it looked good for everybody. The public was satisfied in their mind, and they could move on until it wasn't good anymore. So that's it. Definitely watch this documentary, y'all. It's on Netflix. Check it out. The Confessions Killer. I appreciate you hanging out with me if you're still here. Don't forget to check out the links in the description and the pink comment and all that fun stuff. So that is it. Thank you for hanging out, you guys. And guess what? I'll talk to you soon.